everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. And as always, if the material in this podcast resonates with you, and if you're looking for coaching services, I would love to hear from you. You can find me on Instagram at UnoyaZen or email me directly, lifecoaching at UnoyaZen.com. For this week's episode, I'm really excited to sit down with Mitchell Smolkin. Mitchell is a psychotherapist, author, and speaker. Mitchell believes in helping people find dignity in their suffering such that they can become closer to themselves and others. He is also the host of the podcast, The Dignity of Suffering, which I had the honor to be on as a guest. In this week's episode, Mitchell and I discuss relationships and specifically focus on trauma bonding. Mitchell and I explore how people can confuse trauma bonding for close relationships, and we also touch on the importance of healing. Please find Mitchell on mitchellsmokin.com and on Instagram at I am Mitchell Smokin. And I really hope you can get a lot out of this episode. And if at the end you could leave a five star review, I would truly appreciate it. All right, Mitchell, thank you again for joining the uh, Easy Conversations podcast. I appreciate you reaching out and you know giving me the opportunity to, for us to have this conversation today. Uh, but before we get started, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and talk about some of the work you do. Um, you know, I, I've uh, this is our first time connecting, so I haven't really had the chance to talk to you as well. So this will be also uh, new information for me as well. Sure. Thank you, first of all, for having me on. And it's great to connect and hear that you're uh, reaching out in many of the ways that are close to my heart. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist. I'm primarily based in Stockholm, Sweden, but I've been increasingly doing uh, more writing and teaching. And I have my own podcast called The Dignity of Suffering. And I guess it kind of distills what I love about the work, which is creating space to tolerate uh, vulnerability and, and helping people get closer uh, in, in relationships and also to themselves and just, just changing, I think, a bit the narrative around struggle mm -hmm. uh, because it can get, I think, pretty uh, pejorative in terms of, of all of us kind of on a wild goose chase to be mentally healthy, whatever that means. But we can get into that today. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's absolutely. kind of, you know, <laughs> that's kind of a broad framework of what I love and what I do. And, and how long have you been practicing for um, in this field? And, and maybe if you can shed some light on what inspired you to do this work? Yeah, so I have been a psychotherapist, I think for about 12 years now. And I knew I wanted to be a therapist from when I was in high school and I was sitting on the stairs of the high school next to my friend, Carolyn Holdsworth. I think she was talking about a boy or something. <laughs> I remember saying to myself, oh, I really like listening. And, and, and this little thought was like, I'm going to be a therapist when I'm older. Uh, but I'm also a performing artist, a singer, an actor. Uh, it's probably why I'm in Canada right now. I'm giving a bunch of concerts here. And so the kind of therapy I wanted to do to get into to Jungian psychoanalysis, you couldn't train until your 30s. Hmm. And so they want you to go out there and do what you love. In my case, it ended up being, being an artist, being an artistic director, building huge festivals. And so uh, then after I did that for about a decade, I then started my graduate work in, in psychology. And, uh, uh, and I just find, I find the study of human emotions and, and the psyche uh, very exhilarating and fulfilling. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's amazing. And uh, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, you're, you dabble in other areas too. So being a musician and actor, that's pretty cool. Um, and, and definitely inspiring in that sense. Um, and I guess when, when we touch on relationships and, uh, you know, you mentioned that that's something you also uh, help other people with. Uh, what are some of the things you tell people when it comes to relationships and, and how are you able to help them uh, when, when they're struggling in that sense? 
Who? Where do where do we begin? <laughs> <laughs> so I should say that I I in my internship in psychology was asked to see couples and there was very little framework for that. And so this is going back also about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I did my own research and I found that in Canada, actually in Ottawa, there was a, there is a center which teaches couples therapy around the world. And I immediately flew there and trained there well, for years in what's called emotion focused therapy for couples or emotion focused couples therapy. Um, and so to answer your question, I sort of have to go kind of in a roundabout way mm -hmm. um, because relationships in 2021 are very different than they were a number of years ago, it, specifically around the ways that we are demanded upon now to talk about our inner lives in many parts of the world that was historically not the case. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that couples were happier before. It's not that because couples were contained by religion or gender roles that they were happier. If you scratch the surface, divorce rates actually haven't changed that dramatically. Mm -hmm. It's just that if you look in the news every single day, there's somebody else that is losing their job or being kicked out of a company or in trouble because of how they have talked about their emotions, even mm -hmm. recently with the Olympics in Japan yeah. and the head of the IOC made disparaging comments about women, what happened? He's gone. Yeah. <laughs> so particularly for men, because men have been in the spotlight, learning, learning how to, in a sophisticated, embodied, delicate, and deliberate way to talk about what's going on is not something that we are trained as human beings to do for a whole bunch of reasons, which we can get into today. Mm -hmm. And so, so the, the research and the training that I did looks very carefully at how the human nervous system uh, develops ways of processing our somatic physiological experience. And, and romantic relationships have a huge survival element to them, which is talked about a lot nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it is also the place where we experience the, the biggest range of our emotional life, which confuses people because they don't, don't understand how they can treat their partner a particular way, or they can be treated particularly, but they can go to the grocery store and be nice to the grocery clerk or nice at work. But there's good reasons for that. Yeah. And so I help couples by, first of all, giving them a framework to begin to really normalize the intensity of emotion that exists in relationships then i tell them it's going to take a long time <laughs> yeah yeah and then i slow things right down and start building brick by brick depending on the relationship what is needed to heal and to start to have very concrete flexible tools to achieve closeness Mm -hmm. which I know is very broad, but we can, we can get into some of the minutia of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that makes tons of sense. And, and I think uh, one of the things, you know, I, I talk a lot about with other guests or, or including my friends, like the added complexity in today's world is, is the, the amount of access both men and women have to other people uh, through whether it's online dating or just going out. And, and I don't know if that was an, obviously that wasn't an issue even 10, 15 years ago. And do you feel like that's creating additional challenges in relationships where people almost look at relationships as something that's fairly disposable? You know, you kind of end this one and you can move, easily move on to another one without having to take accountability or taking that time to do your inner work or really understand what are the things that are holding you back to be uh, fully present in a relationship? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure if this is related, but but I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm, I'm Jewish. And in my tradition, um, men would not be allowed alone in the same room with a woman who wasn't their wife. Mm. You'd have to have another person present. 
And I guess the reason I bring that up when you talk about sort of like the fact that that there's such accessibility to, you know, I remember I was doing a show in New York many years ago and we had a dresser, right? Somebody who came to do our costumes and everything. And this was this was many years ago. This is maybe 15 years ago. I remember him saying, come on, guys, today, today we have to get we have to get dressed quickly. I have a threesome at three o'clock. <laughs> And that was my first introduction to being like, oh, you can schedule, you can schedule your threesome or you can schedule when you're going to, you know, be with somebody. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it was shocking. But the reason I bring up my tradition of sort of these like strict rules, which were not a part of my own upbringing, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the theology of it. Yeah. Was because they got it. They, they, they understood. They understood that we are weak we are, you know, we, it is powerful to, to meet somebody. And as Carl Jung said, you know, meeting, meeting someone and falling in love is like having a seizure. So, mm -hmm. um, so I agree with you. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, it's become commodified. It's like, it's like relationships are like filtered through, through like Amazon. If you don't mm -hmm. like it, you know, you can yeah. return it. And, yeah. and that's, that's pretty tricky for the human uh psyche <laughs> absolutely yeah and it's funny you mentioned the kind of the tradition i i'm pakistani by background and and very similar cultural traditions where you know to the point where you're not in a way it's frowned upon to talk to other women that you're not married to or or, or there's a certain sense of like you know again things have changed dramatically over the last few years but just growing up in that culture i knew like you know you almost needed a a middle person to, to relay messages, even if you were to pursue someone. So, um, you know, again, it makes sense. And now we're in a completely different world where, you know, you, you can talk to pretty much have access to anyone in the world through social media or, or dating apps. So I just find that interesting personally, because I feel like that has created a, a huge issue from my, from my perspective on uh, how people approach relationships. And for me, the biggest thing I try to focus on myself and tell others as well is, you know, th th there's a certain amount of accountability you need to take. Um, and, you know, you need to do some work individually, but then you also need to find a partner who you can grow with and, and who encourages your growth and you encourage their growth. And I don't feel those types of conversations happen today. And, and uh, when things get tough, like you said, when you work with kept couples, you tell them this is going to take a really long time. And I feel a lot of people aren't willing to put in that work, whether it's their own insecurities or own resistance, or they just feel like, what's the point of investing all this time if things don't work out? Yeah, I think it's really hard. You know, I know that when I, I've been married for be 20 years next year. <laughs> and and it, many ups and downs, mm -hmm. many moments of not really sure, you know, especially early on when, when you, like you said, you're, you're growing next to somebody. But if I've learned anything in my work and in my own process, I have a lot of respect for what it takes to slow down and actually let, let somebody in emotionally. And and I think that that's what we know when we look at relationships and relationships that are more susceptible to things like affairs or people needing to go outside of the relationship mm -hmm. to soothe a certain emotional craving. Um, that has a lot to do with trust. And But it's it, like you pointed out, it's, it's an evolution. And I, I honestly, with the people I see from around the world, people are just... It's so overwhelming to to begin to get naked emotionally. It takes it's exhausting. Like one of my clients this morning at the end of the session, she was just like, "I'm so tired," <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because you, you know family and how we were raised, and uh, you know I was just writing about this before we got on the call. You know the style with which we were, you know, trained in terms of reaching for emotions and how easy that was, and whether we had to to really ramp up to be heard or you know all all of this is crucial to a relationship feeling satisfying enough where we feel like there's an easy accessibility 
to uh, to anchor us and to ground us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know if the um, accessibility to others has changed that drive in us. If you read Shakespeare, if you, you know, if you look at the history of infidelity, yeah, uh, it, it's it's epic in terms of you know you go back to Freud's early writing. He wrote a book called Totem and Taboo. And this was looking at how cultures had to put in strict measures mm-hmm. to protect people from, this is from incest, right? This yeah. is, so all, all to say that, that I agree that the fluidity of, of social media and our access gives a vehicle for our instincts. Uh, but the, the training and the maturational idea of the human being goes way, way back. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, um, you know, so we're in good company. I, I like that idea because it feels less like, oh my God, it's 2021, it's never going to work. It's like, no, this has been hard forever. Yes. Uh, you know, which is a good thing that you can sort of look around and be like, yeah, it's really, really hard. Yeah. 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 No, I agree 100%. I mean, you know, we obviously over time get tested in different ways, but ultimately uh, the challenges are the same, as you've said, uh, and, and kind of looking back at, at some of the older readings and, and cultures and traditions, you can appreciate that they also struggled uh, with similar challenges, but obviously in a different way. Um, but I think one of the other things, that, and you know, we talked about it before we got on uh, the recording, but uh, I think a lot of times in my own personal experience in doing some of the work I've done, um, is recognizing how our childhood patterns continue to repeat in our relationships. And I think, in my opinion, um, that is probably one of the biggest challenges most couples confront because they keep repeating the same behaviors and you know, seldom do they look inward to see what role are they playing in that conflict. Um, and a lot of it, I think, stems from childhood trauma, whether we were neglected or abandoned or rejected. Those fears keep repeating themselves and, and our attachment styles continue to show up. Um, what are your thoughts around that? And, and do you help like the, the couples you work with in that, in that space as well? Yeah, so the way I think about it is the following. It, it's, it's a no-brainer that Alfred Adler calls it free training in our families, right? We get free training. You, you take a, a baby, all the trillions of neuroreceptors. It's like, it's, like, it's like having a coach in baseball or whatever your sport is. And you spend 10,000 hours learning to hit the yeah. ball in a certain way or cricket or whatever, you name it, right? Yeah. You know, 10,000 hours. And, and if you open up the brain of a concert pianist, for instance, and you do an fMRI, you'll find blood congregates in such massive ways around, you know, the extremities because they have to learn how to play the piano. Yeah. So the fact that we, the fact that we go into relationships for me is not so much that we're repeating patterns. We are the patterns. There's no Mm -hmm. other pattern. You don't have a choice. Yeah. You know, you ask a pitcher to change how they pitch, everything goes, to, everything goes sideways because yeah. they change one small thing. So I think first we have to wrap our heads around the fact that, well, even before we get there, I think the way we are, you know, these are our superpowers. You know, you and I doing podcasts and interviewing and being maybe a bit more extroverted or focused on emotions, I'm sure there are reasons from our own families that we're doing this, which make us maybe, you know, semi good at it or, you know, Mm -hmm. passionate about it. Yeah. So first of all, if somebody is the one who's always wanted to talk about feelings in a relationship, great, that's their superpower. If someone has always wanted to run away from the burning building and go for a walk and not talk about it, I'm sure in many respects that serves them very well. Maybe they're a lawyer, maybe they're an accountant, maybe they do something where it benefits them to be reserved. Mm -hmm. so then the question is well as adults how do we then begin to challenge the well-worn grooves of our personality and our emotions and for the human nervous system that's terrifying Mm -hmm. it's absolutely terrifying it's 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 non-being right it's to to 
to go into a space of behaving differently as an adult feels like we're a kid again. Mm -hmm. And so no wonder we all resist it at all costs because it's not comfortable. We don't recognize our personality. It makes us anxious. We don't know how to behave. We don't have language. I mean, I can go on and on. Yeah. <laughs> so, so people in my practice, I have to constantly, and I get more and more bold as I get older, where I just, I don't let the habitual pattern go. Mm -hmm. From the first session, I'll be right in their faces. From the first session, I'm like, no, I'm not letting you do that here. Like, that's not why you're paying me. You can do it for free at home. Yeah. We're going to slow it down. And that's when the tears flow. Or, or, or people get angry with me because they feel this sense of vulnerability. And, but it just, you know, so in my own view, it really is a courageous, difficult, understandable transition to have to work on our inferior muscles. Mm -hmm. it took me years to figure out, like you said earlier, we don't even know sometimes what's driving our response. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, we're, we're too stuck in our own, I'm not gonna swear on your podcast, but you know, <laughs> you know we're, we're, just, we're just really stuck in our own ways, like the fish in the fishbowl. And so I, I, I appreciate why it's so hard. It makes complete sense. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's all we've known. It's what we're comfortable with. And anything outside our comfort zone is hard. And, and that's obviously, you know, uh, I talk about that a lot. Um, and, and I guess it, it's just one of the things I try to do. And, and when you speak about vulnerability is being able to kind of, it, once you kind of recognize what are the things that you bring to the table, whether, like you said, it's your superpowers, being able to articulate that and, and hopefully, you know, uh, have someone on the other side who's also willing to do that so then at least you guys are both aware of the triggers and, and then you can have that compassion and grace for each other where when the triggers do come up you're able to to mitigate them uh you know in a healthy way as opposed to creating this huge conflict and then both people just having that resentment building to, uh, for each other yeah i think the willingness as you pointed out is a big part you know, I mean, that is a huge ingredient. If someone's listening and you, you know, you're struggling, it's like, if you both, if you both want to fix it, don't walk, run, run to a good couples therapist, because that, that does happen more quickly. When I talked mm -hmm. about it, it being a long time, if two people are really willing, it's, it's like magic every session because they're there for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but, but when it comes to trauma, or when it comes to having no precedent for safe attachment, the whole notion of willingness gets a lot more complicated because somebody may really not understand uh, that they can put down their weapons. You know, and if someone's been really hurt, mm -hmm. it's going to cause them tremendous anxiety to, to uh put themselves into somebody else's arms and those are harrowing sessions i mean people it's just it's completely destabilizing to ask somebody who's been through sexual trauma or physical trauma or never seen anyone take care of them for, for me it's not about a willingness to change there's no there's no map for it. There's no physiological map for safety. It doesn't exist. This is the work of Bessel van der Kolk in, in, in mm -hmm. Boston, who you're asking someone to do something that they have no precedent for. People will often use the word, I'm, I'm confused, or I mm -hmm. don't know what to do. Or earlier today, somebody said, uh, this is hard. My mind goes blank. Mm -hmm. and, and when someone says my mind goes blank, that, that's amazing. Of course it goes blank. He's because yeah. you, you literally, there's literally no, it's like taking someone who played baseball and throwing them on the rugby pitch. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So, so what do you suggest when like, uh, if a client comes to you and says, uh, my mind is going blank, well, what, what do you offer them in, in response? Well, um, so in that particular moment, like today, when, when I'm asking someone to take a risk and, and do something that makes them deeply uncomfortable, we stay there. We stay with the blankness. We stay with the discomfort. We name, for starters, 
we put language to that kind of vulnerability. It is literally the same thing of a, of a, of a child mm -hmm. learning for the first time how to say, I'm hungry. Yeah. Or, which is why it's so hard for adults, right? Because we feel so small. The, the neuroscience, which I love around this, is that when we get to those moments of feeling lost, and this is a more practical tip for couples, which I love to talk about, don't overstep the feelings of discomfort. Don't feel like you have to leapfrog over the fact that a conversation makes you nervous or you don't have the language for it. Being able to just say to somebody, I don't know what to tell you, or I don't know how to put this into words, or my chest is tightening up, or my throat is, is tightening up, or I have butterflies. All of those very simple communications from a neurophysiological standpoint, they create safety. Mm -hmm. It's when we rely too heavily on our, on our uh, well-worn grooves of like, which I'm guilty of too, as a therapist, I would come home and feel like I had everything figured out. Yeah. And, and that didn't make my wife safe because from her point of view, it's like, why are you even talking to me if you have it all figured out? Yeah. You know, she needed to see me in a, in a vulnerable place so her brain could literally register and go, oh, Oh, he yeah. needs me. Yeah. He, yeah. He needs me. And so that, that is what I'll do in a couple situation. And in, in an individual situation, I will explore what the person's fears are and put that literally listed out. Just a part of me is afraid to bring this up because I don't want her to yell at me. A part of me mm -hmm. is afraid to talk about this because I don't want to lose the relationship. Part mm -hmm. of me, you know, feels like, uh, uh, it might blow everything up, whatever it is, you know, yeah. um, you just got to put language to that. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, what you mentioned about being able to give that safety to each other is essentially the mirror neurons that you talk about, right? When you're able to see the other person do it, it's just, you feel safe to give it back to them. And, and it's an important thing. And, and um, sorry, go ahead. No, it's funny. It's, well, it's funny you mentioned that because that is exactly what happened in the session today. Yeah. So after this man, right, right, after he said that, after he said, like, my mind is going blank. This is really hard for me. Uh, I normally shut down when I get scared. Do you know what she said? She said, hey, she goes, you doing that encourages me to take a risk to open up with you next time. Because mm -hmm. both of these people are quite quiet. Yeah. And, and I, I, to be honest with you, I was, I was actually blown away. Like I've done thousands of hours of sessions and I was like, oh my God, that is so cool. Like, like she doesn't feel blamed. Yeah. She doesn't feel criticized. She doesn't feel like she's something wrong. She feels inspired, you know? And that's what she told him that it incurred, it was a relief and it was refreshing to hear him open up. And she, and he was like, hey, that's all I want. All he wants yeah. is for her to feel encouraged to open up with him. So anyway, sorry, I, I interrupted you. No, no, I think that's a very important point because, you know, you're creating that safety and basically within that container of the relationship where now both people feel like they can trust the other person with, with their emotions and feelings. And, you know, unfortunately, what I see a lot of the times uh, and in my own experience is each person's waiting for the other person to take that risk. It's like, I'm going to wait for her or I'm going to wait for him to do it first before I give it to them. And, and then you just end up waiting a lot of the times. Um, and then <clears throat> another thing you mentioned, which is, I think, uh, a really cool perspective, because I've never thought of it that way, is putting language to it. Because like you said, that's why adults feel like they almost feel uh, becoming too vulnerable because then they feel almost like small, right? Like you said, they feel like a child. So that's, that's a very important uh, point to make is, is by being putting, by being able to put language to it, you can alleviate some of that too. Yeah. I had a, a colleague in, in Ottawa in Canada, she worked in the military <laughs> and at one of our conferences, she joked, she put her hand up and she said that there's a four letter word in the military feel yeah you know which which makes sense if you're trained if you're trained to protect yourself at all costs you know there is someone i see in the military right now and it 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 was a hard one trust with him 
because I was asking him to go into his body. Mm-hmm. And this is the work of Stephen Porges in the States, you know, this notion of interoception, to be able to put perception to our interior life. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important, as you point out, to, you know, to, to really, I think, level the playing field that this is, there are lines in the sand. So, so we look at the, the adverse child experience study in California, which looked at thousands of people over, over many years, this longitudinal study, and it was able to correlate issues in childhood to, to issues in adulthood that were very specific. Mm-hmm. And if there was a lack of mentalization of emotion growing up, and let's be culturally sensitive here as well. Yeah. In some, in some cultures, it's more collective. Yeah. You don't talk about your personal feelings. You don't communicate them. And so if you all of a sudden move to the States or to Canada or, you know, it's going to be, um, this is not someone not doing the work, right? That, that's a bit pejorative, right? This is, this is someone having to, for the first time, feel comfortable to put language, and it could be very shameful. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, and I can relate. I mean, I, my parents were immigrated to Canada, so I grew up <clears throat> almost in the same collectivistic culture at home, but then going to school and stuff, you know, it, it felt different. So it was like, okay, well. Where in Canada were you? Uh, in Montreal is where I grew up. Oh, cool. And uh, <clears throat> I struggled with that because I was trying to balance two cultures. And growing up, when I entered adulthood, I didn't really have the skills on how to express myself or how to ask for what I need. And, you know, I kept getting into relationships where, you know, and, and I, I mentioned patterns, but essentially I kept showing up the same way and feeling frustrated because I'm like, well, I can't have my needs met until I didn't really sit down and, you know, take ownership and, and reflect on, okay, well, what am I doing here? That's creating the same outcome over and over. Um, I didn't really understand the, the role I was playing and where it uh, initiated from. Yeah. And I think it's important that that, that arc right? That arc of becoming aware of ourselves. I mean, that's human consciousness, right? We started out with like primitive drawings, the first, the first art that was sort of like, oh, you know, we can reflect on, our, on the fact that we are human beings, right? That was the sort of, and so it strikes me as you're talking that that, that sort of creative tension of, of emigrating and moving, mm-hmm. it, it just accelerates. It's, 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 you know, it's a catalyst to have to become very self-aware of one's patterns, right? And, and it's frustrating and it's lonely. And often we have to do this however many times to begin to get to know ourselves. But it strikes me that the human being is almost recreating consciousness mm-hmm. every, every time, right? Every yeah. time we're becoming aware of ourselves, you know, the, the Garden of Eden, right? The, yeah. the fall, you know, I, I realize I'm naked. And, you know, I emigrated from... Canada to Sweden three years ago and I didn't really know what it was like to be quote-unquote Canadian uh (laughs) until I was like oh we're we're pretty we're a pretty extroverted emotional bunch to an extent I mean that's a generalization yeah but we're we're more extroverted I was running I'm back in Canada right now and I went for my run this morning and uh these two cyclists passed me like hey have a good day and this driver drove past me and waved And I was like, oh my God, I wrote to my friends back in Sweden, like people won't talk to you there. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. like, there's this interesting way that we get reflected back, you know, um, that I don't know if it's so much a, a deficit or a, but it's just, you know, each of us in our own life has to develop that curiosity so we can let somebody else in, right? Absolutely. As you pointed out, right? Yeah. That, that, you know. Yeah, and one of the things I've really, started to read about and more so primarily because of my own personal experience and and again we touched on it offline but uh you know trauma bonding and and in my previous relationship you know my partner and I we both kept talking about having this deep connection and and keep we kept coming back to the relationship because we felt this connection and until recently like when I didn't you know coming out of it and reflecting on it really 
I realized that it wasn't necessarily a, a, a healthy connection. It was more of a trauma bond. We were both uh, reinforcing that message of rejection and abandonment we had felt as children. And there was this constant push pull uh, and, and that, like I said, validation of the insecurities we had growing up. So we kept going back to each other to, to really get it to be validated in a, in a very unhealthy way. And uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I find it very interesting that, you know, you can almost trick yourself, even though deep down inside in your gut, you know, something doesn't feel right and how this relationship's not good for you. But your mind keeps telling you uh, that no, no, this is there's more here. This is a deep connection, and I I want this. Yeah, I I'm reminded of a book by by uh, Dr. Gabor Mate and Dr. Mm -hmm. Gordon Newfeld called called Hold On to Your Kids, mm -hmm. and and the point that they make in that book, which I think is the best parenting book out there, is that. If you neglect the emotional safety of your children, if you alienate them, if you, you know, create an environment where they ultimately don't want to come to you because you are reactive or withdrawn or something in between, they will, um, fr friendships and romantic relationships will become these unsatiable, uh, you know, places where these huge emotional holes are being met. Mm -hmm. And when we look at uh, when we look at all the ways that human beings have sort of identified disorders, like in the DSM and other, yeah, you no, know, you know, pathologies, one of the main uh, things that we find is is what we call splitting. So something is either all good or something is either all bad, mm -hmm. and and that is a response to trauma where where you're you know. There was not a good enough, there wasn't optimal frustration growing up. This is the work of Heinz Kohut. So, you know, your parents were not aware of kind of letting you down into the world in a good enough way. And so what happens in relationships is that when there are small disappointments and big disappointments, it's, it's excruciating. Mm -hmm. But often that's after a kind of like, like soulmate, I found the one you know, and the pendulum is always swinging from like, I love you, I can't live without you, to I hate you, you disappointed me. Yeah. And, and so I, I tend to look at it a little bit differently because I have seen couples move through that and learn to, to be able to reach out for their needs in a good enough way. Mm -hmm. and nor do I want to pathologize anybody who finds themselves in that situation, but it is not sustainable in any part of our life. It's not sustainable to go into a meeting with your boss and be up all night because you're worried you're gonna get fired mm -hmm. every single time, you know, or, or be so overjoyed when you get feedback, right? That, that you know, that, that's a sign that everything is kind of hinging on the, uh, the relationship either being good or either being bad. And that goes mm -hmm. back a long time. Uh, so being able to be, you know, a little bit sadder in life, but a little bit wiser. <laughs> yeah. You know, which I can, myself, I can see myself in my own marriage, that certain things that in the past I would have just railed against, you know, mm -hmm. like rage coming up and I'm so upset and I can't believe you. And, and as I've matured, it's a bit like, oh no, yeah, I can believe you. This kind of hurts, but it's okay. Like the world's not going to end. And, and that's the real failure. That, that is the failure of uh, parenting where it is chaotic or mm -hmm. there, is, uh, there is serious avoidance. The child does not think deep down they're going to make it mm -hmm. because it's not, um, there's not a good enough sense of, of emotional order in the house. And so then you go into a relationship and it's just so soothing for someone to take an interest in you. It's like, it's a drug. Yeah. Uh, and when you lose that, when the first disappointment, I've had people say so many times in my practice, he promised me he would always take care of me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and when that happened, the person just goes back into the, like, you know, in, in, into the vault and, and the door is sealed and the person is persona non grata. Um, and so that's what we see with certain conditions, uh, um, 
there's no way to deal with the gray the gray area of life. Great, great. Um, and so that I think is when I think about trauma bonds, and they're hard to be honest because in the early parts of couples therapy, it'll feel so euphoric. It's like the first three sessions are like, oh my god, we're finally healed. Yeah. And I'm I'm nervous. Like I'm nervous about the fourth session because they come back and they're like they they're not just at square one; they're below square one because it's mm-hmm. now like, oh, I've opened up with you again and you've hurt me. And you know what? Real life relationships over the long term, they're just they're just not like that. It's, it's, it's unfortunately a bit more subdued, but that allows for a kind of love that is sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, there is a lot of gray area, like you said, and it's not always black and white. And, and I find like, to your point, it, the splitting comment, it, it is, you do see that quite a bit. It, it's all or nothing. Right. And it's like, Oh, this is the best relationship ever. And on the other extreme and like this is what am I doing here I, I can't believe I'm in this relationship and and it's finding that balance where you know to your point both people can come together and and get through those tough times because realistically there are going to be those times and and how do you work together to, to get through them um, so yeah no, I know I appreciate your your perspective on that um, you know, and, and, you know, I can't believe time flew by. Like, this has been a great discussion and conversation. I really appreciate your insight and some of your own personal experiences that have helped with this discussion. And, and at least I've learned a lot too. But uh, for people that want to find you or get a hold of you, uh, what are some of the best ways to, to reach out to you, whether it's social media or online? Sure. So I'm pretty active on Instagram. It's I am Mitchell Smolkin. Uh, that's my handle. And, and I'm interacting with people usually every day and posting a lot of stuff about my work. The name of the podcast is, is The Dignity of Suffering. It's available everywhere. And then on my website, mitchellsmolkin.com, uh, there are resources. I have a book uh, for sale there, an intimacy problem workbook, and also a free, you know, a free uh, uh, ebook as well. If you just come there and... Uh, you know, it'll give you a bit, you know, with exercises and ways to slow down like we talked about today. And um, yeah, try just to name some of these parts uh, more discreetly uh, if we're feeling overwhelmed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and your podcast name, I find that quite interesting, the Dignity of Suffering. What, what inspired that? Uh, my, um, my, my grandfather, uh, my grandfather, lost his entire family in in the second world war Mm -hmm. and and he couldn't uh he couldn't even tell me the names of his parents or his siblings i asked him when i was about 17 or 18 and we were sitting together i had a map out of europe and we both almost fainted when i when i asked him his lips started to move and then i remember i started losing consciousness and so did he and until that point as a teenager i'd felt that somehow he hadn't been he hadn't been a man. Like he couldn't. I'm being over simplistic here, but like mm-hmm. that that part of it was that he couldn't find a way to talk about this. And I realized that the man was in his 80s. He lost his whole family been murdered when he was 20 years old. He'd become a dentist. He'd moved the family. I was here as a result of his life. This had nothing to do with some failure of masculinity. Yeah. <laughs> you know. You know, there are certain things that we can't talk about and and or do. And we have to get, we have to wrap our heads around that in the sense of like, this is not about being authentic in our relationships or finding true love or, you know, these are always going to be good enough approximations. There are things we'll never remember or get through in our life. Mm-hmm. That's why that Buddhist idea of, of, of karma and many lives, I, I like it. You know, in one of yeah. my previous podcasts, it's so that, that's where it came from was to just slow down and, and, um, and, and recognize that going into these areas that cause us a lot of distress is a very dignified act. Mm-hmm. And it is the flip side of success you know that that i always say one of my teachers life is an equal measure of success and failure we, we hope success prevails but you know uh, we have to be ready to fail yeah 
yeah, and, and it's the lesson or the meaning you take out of that failure, right? Which ultimately you can turn into success if. Yeah, maybe, to. but maybe not. Yeah. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe there yeah. is no meaning. I mean, that that's the thing, right? It's like, there was that great American psychologist, James Hillman, who when a waitress would you know, paid the bill and she'd say, have a great day. And he'd say, what if I don't want to? <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> so in some ways i'm being honest here it's a yeah. bit of challenge in that notions of rising up from the ashes what if what if there's no what if it means nothing mm -hmm. that's tough yeah yeah no that's fair no thank thank you for sharing that story and and kind of shedding some light on on you know where the name came from for the podcast and you know again i want to thank you for coming on here and having this conversation with me i'm super grateful that we got this opportunity. Oh, I'm back. grateful. Thank yeah. you for your interest. It means a lot to me. You no, know, no, and I appreciate it. So, you know, looking forward to connect with you again in the future. And uh, yeah, thanks for doing this. Yeah, cool. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. As always, please subscribe to the podcast if you enjoy the episodes or leave a comment in the comment section. I always love hearing from you. Thank you again. And until next week.